Hi everyone, my name is Christopher Woodleaf and I am a teaching assistant at NC State University for Information Systems Development, Business 442, Section 2 for the fall of 2018. Um, today I'm going to bring you guys through the Ice Cream Sales app, which is the second in-class exercise that we did together. Um, and I'm going to show you how uh, I personally go through this exercise, um, how my thought process works behind this, and I'm going to explain a few things along the ways. Um, this is going to be a relatively uh, slower walkthrough um, than last time. I'm going to attempt to explain uh, a few more concepts to you guys. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to understand um, what we're doing as well as what the code is saying. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. All right, so as usual, uh, we'll start out in Microsoft Visual Studio. Go to File, New, Project. Make sure that you have Visual C Sharp selected as well as Windows Format uh, .NET Framework. Under the name, let's name our app. We'll call it uh, Ice Cream Sales App. And make sure you have this uh, di uh, Create Directory for Solutions selected. Also be cognizant of where you're saving your files. Uh, this is becoming a, a theme in our class with um, being unable to locate the uh, project files this is where those files are saved so make absolutely sure that you are aware of where you're saving your files if you have a USB drive and I highly recommend that you have a USB drive save it on that USB drive in a folder that you have for these projects uh, if this is if you're planning to zip up this file and put it up to Google Drive or email yourself or something like that uh, keep in mind that this is where that those files are stored All right, and we'll press OK And this will generate our new project for us. All right, and let's get started. So the first thing that uh, that we'll do is let's take care of a couple of the uh, user interface design tips. Um, as I had mentioned in the previous video, this is something that we'll be looking for when we're grading your applications is to make sure that these things are uh, these things are set. So before we do uh, put any controls on the app, let's go ahead and set some of those. We'll start out with naming the main form, and in order to select your form, um, if you're if you already have controls on your screen already, um, you uh, can make sure that you have the form selected by clicking on the the bar at the top. So let's start out with renaming our form here. We'll go to the Solution Explorer here, and right click on Form One .cs, and we're going to rename it. And we'll call it main form. You'll notice that this capitalization is slightly different from camel casing. We are capitalizing the M in main here. Press enter and say OK. And what that message was basically saying is that all of those references will be changed. Like if something is calling for form one, now it's calling main form. So clicking on the form itself again uh, to select it. You'll notice that main form, if we scroll to the top here, uh, has been renamed as the name, and it also renames that file itself. So it's uh, kind of the two birds, one stone approach by right-clicking on this main form and, and selecting rename. All right, so again, having the uh, main form selected, let's rename this text that we have here where it says form one, and we will call it ice cream sales app. Hit enter, and you'll notice that that title updates there. Let's also change the default font. So we will, uh, again, making sure you have that form selected. Let's go to font, which is right here. Press the ellipsis button, and we want Sego UI right here, regular, and number nine. Press OK. All right. So that takes care of uh, some of the user interface design tips for now. And when we build out our user interface further, we'll go ahead and um, take care of the rest of those things. All right. So what we're doing here in this ice cream sales app is that this is almost like a simplistic cash register for, uh, for this mom and pop shop that sells um, ice cream scoops. Um, the information that we want from this app 
is how much to charge the customer. So in order for us to know that information, if you think back on any transaction you've done in the past, you need the uh, quantity of the item that you're purchasing, you need the price of the item, and for those who are from outside of the United States, this is a very uh, frustrating concept, I'm sure, uh, but there's also the sales tax, um, VAT, uh, in the EU. Um, in the United States, we calculate that separately, whereas, uh, whereas usually worldwide it's more uh, included in the price. So what we'll need here is that number of scoops and the unit price will also need to know the sales tax rate. Um, for this particular example, the sales tax rate, we are going to hard code into the, uh, into the code itself. So we're not, going to, um, we're not going to make that as a user input. So what we need from the person who's operating that cash, uh, cash register is we need the number of scoops that, they are, uh, that the customer is purchasing, or, or let's say cones, um, and the price of those cones. And that, those two pieces of information will give us the cost. Um, something else that we'll also put into this app is a, uh, is a list box. And that list box is going to list out a subtotal, it's going to list out sales tax, and it's going to list out uh, the total cost, kind of like a receipt, a simplistic receipt. So let's get started. The two pieces of information that we need to know from this user is the number of scoops and the unit price. So uh, if you think about what we uh, what we need, we need to get information from the from the user. So this user has to have a way to provide it to the application. And the way that we're going to do that is a new control that we learned last class, and that is the text box. And that is, if we double click this here, or you can click and drag it. The text box is an area where a user can just click into this box and enter in um, a piece of information. So obviously we don't know, if you think about it from the context of the user, we don't know what, uh, what this box wants from us. So we have to make sure that we uh, label it. And the way that we're gonna do that is through a label. So I'm gonna double click it here. And we're going to move this, I don't know, right here. And there are two types of labels that we are going to, uh, that we're going to be working with here. Um, and they're the same, it's the same control, it's that label control here in the toolbox, it's the same thing. But there are two differentiating, uh, well, there are, the, the category is uh, a smart label and dumb label. And what we mean by that is a smart label is a label that, uh, that displays information, that gives you information. And a dumb label is a label that's simply meant to identify something. So what we're putting here is a dumb label. And this dumb label is going to tell us what, or is going to tell the user what they're going to put in this text box that we just placed on the form. So in order to um, label this accordingly, um, make sure you have label selected, go to your properties um, uh, pane here, and we're gonna go to text. And let's name this number of scoops. Yep. And we'll put a colon here at the end. All right, so we've got that. And the next thing that we need to know is we need to know the unit price. So it's pretty much the same thing, so I'm just gonna copy and paste these here. Select that. And we'll rename this text here, unit price. Okay. And then the next thing we'll want to know is the cost. Now the cost, I'm gonna copy and paste this for illustration's sake. Let's go ahead and just rename this to cost. But if you think about it, the cost itself is not going to be something that the user provides to us. It's not going to be um, we're displaying information, we're giving information back to the user, we're not requesting this information. So we're not going to place this in a text box, instead we're going to place this in a label, a smart label in this case. This smart label is going to display the total cost to us at the end. So we'll delete this text box, 
right click on it, press delete, since I don't have a delete key on my keyboard. And let's put a label here. And if you think back to our last example, um, we, had a, uh, we had to turn the auto size property off. Um, and we're going to want to do that here, just so we can make it kind of uniform with these boxes here. I like to keep things as uniform as possible. So making sure that we have that label selected, let's go turn auto size off, which is right here. All right, and then I'll resize this to, I don't know, approximately the size of a text box here. All right. And let's put a border on this thing, just so we can kind of see the boundaries of it. So in order to do that, make sure that you have that label selected. And in the properties, you're going to see border style. And let's change border style to fixed single. And that's going to put a fixed singular border on this label. And because I can be a little OCD, um, we are going to... Um, uh, we're going to change that text alignment there. And you basically see how label four is kind of in that uh, upper left hand corner. I'm going to instead change that so it's in the center, uh, uh, center left, so it's in the center of the label. And that will be in. Sorry, oh, that's why I can't find it. Yeah, uh, a perfect example where you always want to make sure that you have the uh, the correct label or the correct control that you are uh, trying to change properties for. Um, this is the perfect example because what I was looking for wasn't there, but that's because I had the form selected instead of the label selected. So making sure that that uh, label is selected, I'm going to go here to text align, and I will change that to right here, the middle left. All right, and I don't want that to say label four, so um, instead I will have it say, uh, let's say for the time being zero, zero, zero. Or actually, let's just leave it blank. All right, and we'll resize that so it's nice and in line with everything. There we go. All right, so we got those three. Now we want kind of that receipt output kind of thing uh, that you'll see if you're looking at the if you're looking at the instruction sheet. What that what that box is is that's not a tech that's not a, a text box with multiple lines in it. That's that's called a list box, and this uh, list box is a way to display items of information. So. If you think about um, um, if you think about different forms that you've seen online, where you select different things, like from a choice, your your list box could either be a drop down or it could just be a list of items where you select it. Um, that's what this is. So let me double click on a list box here, and we're just going to add that to the form. Let's just say that big for now. All right. So we have where the user is going to provide us the number of scoops. We have where the user is going to provide the price of the scoops. But there's no way to kick off the um, there's no way to kick off that calculation. So in order for us to do that, we need to have a button to indicate to the user of this application. All right, now we're going to calculate uh, the total cost. So I'm going to play double click on button here. I'll make it say this big all right and we're going well let's go ahead and rename this now and we'll call this calculate remember with the user interface design tips you're going to want to provide shortcuts for as many things that you possibly can and that's because you want to um, you won't f when you deal with users that use the same application over and over and over you want to provide them an easy way to navigate through the application as fast as possible. So we're going to go ahead and give this a shortcut, an alt shortcut um, of C. For uh, We're going to call the button calculate, but we want the C to be our shortcut key. So let's position our cursor in front of that C there and add that ampersand. Press enter and you'll notice here there is a... Um, 
there is an underlying C, and that indicates that the C is the uh, is the shortcut key there. Well, Alt C. All right, and just because I don't want to resize the button to the same size, I'll uh, copy and paste that button again. And let's name this clear because once we calculate everything, what if we want to just clear the form? If we want to remove all the information from the, uh, from the screen, we want to um, keep it clean. So we'll have this button clear and that's going to remove all the information from the form. So clear. But if we wanted to add a shortcut to this, there is a problem because so far we've done the first letter of the word. In this case, this would be C. So, I mean, you could name it something else and, um, and you can call it erase or something. Um, but instead of, uh, instead of renaming uh, this button from clear to erase or something, let's just make the shortcut key something different. Let's say L. So I'll add the ampersand in front of that L. All right, and hit enter, and you'll notice that the L is underlined here in clear. All right, let's do this one more time for exit, because at the end of the day, we just want to exit this uh, exit this application. We don't want to uh, leave it open all the time. So let's add an exit button. So make sure that that button is selected. Let's go down here into text, and we will call it exit. So kind of with the conventions that we have for this class, instead of having the E as the uh, shortcut key here, we're going to want to add the um, shortcut onto the X. So we'll put that ampersand in front of the X and press enter. All right. And this is more or less what we have for, uh, for the user interface of our app. So we, we want it to look nice, so we don't want to add have too much leftover space here. So I'm going to resize this form. Let's just say to right there. All right. So we kind of have that, that basic skeleton of what our user interface will look like. Now, the one thing you didn't notice me do is I didn't rename any of these controls. And like I had mentioned in the previous video, you want to make sure that you have all of your controls named before you start coding. It's going to make your life a lot easier if you do this ahead of time. All right, so let's go ahead and name our controls. So we're not going to name our dumb labels because our dumb labels, we're not, we're not going to be referencing this at all in our code. So it's completely fine if you wanted to leave this as, as you notice here, label one. So I'm going to skip the dumb labels, but we'll name these, these components that will change, that will be altered, that will be called by the code. All right, so let's choose this first text box here. And I'm going to name this text box, uh, I'm going to go a little different from the, uh, from the instructions because, uh, like I had mentioned in the previous video, you want these... Um, you want these names to be intuitive to you. They have to be intuitive to other people as well, especially those who are going to be reading through your code and maintaining your code in the future. But you want them to be uh, you want them to be intuitive to you. So uh, I believe in the instructions. It might be something like uh, number of scoops uh, text box or something like that. But instead of doing that, I'm going to call this uh, quantity text box. And press enter because to me that that's just that's a lot better for me all right for unit price uh, make sure that you have that that uh, text box selected I also have noticed this um, when um, going around helping y'all with uh, with your applications in class is don't select your label and, and name your label something like um, unit price text box you must make sure that your that the actual text box is the one that is selected. That's the one you need to be renaming. All right, and let's rename this to um, I'm going to say price text box. Press enter. All right, and then we get to the cost label. Keep in mind that this is not a text box. This is a label, so make sure that you name it accordingly. So I'm going to, instead of calling this cost text box, I'm going to call this total text box. 
press enter. All right, and for this list box here, I like to look at this as more of a um, as more of a receipt. Um, so what I'm going to do is instead of calling it totals list box as it is in the instructions, I'm going to call it receipt uh, list box. Now, keep in mind, these things can be named whatever you want them to be named. This does not have to be unless it is specifically stated in the instructions. You can name this what you want to name it. Again, has to be intuitive to you. So um, instead, I'll call it receipt. Uh, list box. I'm sorry. This is a list box. And press enter. All right. And for receipt list boxes, you'll notice that the name, or for list boxes in general, you'll notice that the name of the control is actually in the control itself here. Kind of like how there would be text inside of a text box. But this actually doesn't show up. This is more of an identifier because um, you won't see a text. Uh, Making having this receipt list box selected here, you'll notice that there's no text here. Um, these are instead called items. Um, but this is this receipt list box text here is just identifying it to us as we're in this uh, view. It's a little different from your. Uh, it's a little different from your text boxes. So just want to point that out. All right. So we got that named. Let's go ahead and rename this. Uh, calculate button here. And hit enter. I will name this one the clear button. And I will name this one the exit button. All right, we're all named here. That's good. All right, so another thing that I'm going to go over that is in, uh, we're going to go back to the user interface uh, design tips and best practices. Um, I want to complete this user interface before we go into uh, coding. So one of the things that you may do, you may not recognize that you do it, is that when you're going through different forms, let's say in your web browser or other applications, you press tab to go to the next box. Well, sometimes your your uh, sometimes they go out of order, and that can get kind of frustrating, especially if you're filling out order information in a in a web form or something, and you want to make sure that that experience is right for the customer as well. So there is a way to set that here. By default, the controls as you add them on. That's the order in which the tab will go. So if you start out in this text box and you press tab, and let's say I created this text box next, it would go to this one. Um, that's the default behavior. But just to make sure that everything is right, we want to make sure that, that what's called the tab order is in order. So we're going to go to view, and then we're going to want to go to tab order, which is right down here. And you'll see these uh, you'll see these numbers here. That's if you think about bus stops, that's where your tabs are going to stop in that order. So I want to set my own order, and it really is just as simple as clicking on the control. So there's really no reason to tab to that label there. So we're going to start out here. So zero. And remember, it starts out with zero, not one. One. Um, let's say we go to two, three, four, five. Um, and that would be the order that, uh, that I'm thinking would be right. Now, in case you mess up, let's go ahead and turn tab order off here. You can always change it. You can go to view, tab order, and you could do it again. All right, so let's say I want to go zero, one, two, three, four, five. You could do that. All right. Think about what's more logical to the user themselves. All right. So we'll turn this off. We don't want to see that anymore. So we have that set. So the next thing that we're going to want to do is think about when the user presses enter on the keyboard and when the user presses the escape key on the keyboard. Um, when you when you look at this form and you think, all right, when I press the enter key, what do I want it to do? I don't want it to clear. 
I don't want it to exit. I want it to calculate the information that I have put in. So let's set the, um, let's make that shortcut of the enter key the calculate button. And the way that you do that is having that form selected. Go to your properties window and we will look for the accept button which is right here. And we're going to make this the calculate button. All right. Same thing for when we hit the escape key on our keyboard. The escape key, we want to exit the, the application. So um, in order to do that is again making sure that the uh, form is selected. Let's go to our cancel button here, which equates to the escape key. And we'll make this the exit button. Okay. All right. And once you have all of the, your controls on the form, you want to lock this this user interface. And the reason why is you don't want inadvertently to come back and to accidentally move something or to change a control around. If you make a change here, especially, especially when you're working in teams, um, if, if you are, have pretty much finalized what your user interface looks like and you don't want anybody to change it, at least you know, not without making absolutely sure that they intend to change it, you want to lock your user interface. And the way that you lock your user interface is quite simple. Just right click on the form and it says lock controls. So what you'll notice here is that, uh, is that when you select these different controls, you'll notice a little lock icon on them. Now I'm clicking and dragging. I cannot move them. I can't change them. And that's good because we've pretty much finalized, hey, this is what we want our application to look like. This is great. So leave it alone. So that's, that's uh, what you achieve by locking your form. Now, as you code, as, you, uh, as your requirements change, you know, that, that can, um, you may need to change that user interface. No problem at all. Um, you just add a little extra step, and this extra step is just to make absolutely sure that you do intend to change something. So you right-click on the form just like you locked it, press lock controls again, and then, hey, you can, um, you can change things, add things, remove things again. All right. We'll put that back and lock the control, and we're all good. So we are ready to start coding our interface. All right, so what we're going to do, first of all, is to, uh, let's see, what, what do we want to start with? Uh, I'll probably start with, let's say, the clear button. And I'm going to start with that just because uh, it, I, I want everything to get right back to where it was, especially if you're uh, especially if you're testing something. You definitely want the feature to, to like reset your form back to where it was. Um, functional. So let's go ahead and start with that. So I'm going to double click on clear. That's going to bring me into the coding interface. So um, as I had mentioned in the previous video in the lab, and as a good practice to get into, and something that is required when we grade your work, is you want to make sure that you put your name on this. So before I start coding that clear button, Let's go ahead and add that requisite information. So I'm going to go right to the top. Remember it's slash slash. And then I'm going to add my name and the date. And today is September 2nd. All right. Actually, I'll just call that created. How about that? Sometimes you can add another. Well, you can. This is really up to you. Something else I like to add is modified. All right, and then let's add our this. this let's put the assignment first. Did I spell that wrong? Ah, nope, we're good. Uh, the assignment is the ice cream. Did spell that wrong. That's bothering me. All right, and let's add our purpose. The purpose of this application is to calculate the total cost, or you know, the total cost of the transaction given 
the number of ice cream scoops and the price per scoop. All right. And also on the lines of coding, or now that we have that header done, and also on the lines of commenting, rather, is we're, let's add a comment to the clear button. So what the clear button does is to clear um, uh, user-provided information as well as calculated information from the form. All right. So if we think back to our different controls that we have, when we hit calculate, we expect something to show up in number of scoops. We expect something to show up in unit price. We expect something to show up in uh, the cost. We expect something to show up in the receipts list box. We want that to go away when we click clear. All right, so let's start out with these text boxes here. So we have quantity text box and we have price text box. All right. So let's do quantity. quantity text box and the text boxes have this cool, cool little function here um, this let's say shortcut to clearing it and it's just called clear All right. and when you do something like a function you're going to want to make sure that you have your parentheses around it and your semicolon so that clears that quantity text box same thing for the uh, price text box All right, so we got those two set. Now, labels are a little bit different. So now we're gonna look at our label here. We've got our cost label, total, um, total text box. Or, or, wow, this is actually a label. I think I had mentioned this when I was, um, when I was uh, putting this on here and then I make that exact mistake. This is the total label and press enter. And I apologize for that. All right. So going back here, all right, price text box list. So our labels don't have that same functionality to, to clear. It's, we have to instead set the, uh, we instead have to set that text to nothing. And nothing in the world of C sharp is called null. So let's uh, go ahead and um, set that. So total label. And we want to call attention to the text of it. We want to set that text equal to nothing. In this case, null, semicolon. So we're saying, go to the total label. Let's look at the text property. The equals is we're going to set that to null, which is nothing. All right. Now we're going to go to the list box. So we got our receipt list box. Now, the list boxes are also different from the labels, and they're different from the text boxes. Each of the items that are in that list box is not referred to as just the text. It's referred to as items. So if you go to uh, back to the designer view and you click on it, if you wanted to add items in there, if you want to pre-populate those items there, you're going to want to... Um, you're going to want to go into the items property instead of the text property. So to clear the items from your list box, you're going to say receipt list box dot items right, dot clear. <clears throat> All right, great. So another thing that you want to think about is the user experience you pretty much want the user if you think about you doing uh, or uh, operating an application you want to do as little work as humanly possible right so after you hit the clear text box let's let's go over here and take a look at this <clears throat> or the clear button rather once you hit that clear button what are you going to be doing next well you're going to be starting this whole process over again so naturally, you would be going into the number of scoops. Now, how can we cut that process out? We can cut that process out that by, when we, by clicking that clear button. After it clears everything, we put your cursor right back up into number of scoops. That eliminates um, a step that the user has to take to use your app. 
And basically, the least number of actions that a user has to provide makes your application a lot more friendlier, a lot easier to use, a lot more efficient. So in order to do that, we'll go back here to our code. Well, think about where do you want your, your cursor to go after you hit the clear button? Well, you want, we want it to go into the quantity text box up here. So let's go ahead and say quantity text box. And the function that we're going to want to use here is called focus. We want to focus on that text box after we hit the clear button. So basically after clearing all of this up here, setting those labels to null, clearing the items out of the list box, we want our cursor to go right into the quantity text box. So we want it to focus on that. So it's called focus. Just like that. Parentheses, semicolon, and that is it. So basically what this is going to do, reading through this in plain English, is when we hit the clear button, clear any of the text in quantity text box, clear any of the text in the price text box, set that total label where we see the total to nothing, to null, and then clear all of the items from the receipt list box. And after we've done all of that, then we want to focus on the quantity text box. That is what that button will do. We should be good there. All right, so the next thing that, um, that we'll code is, well, let's go ahead and code this exit button here. Might as well, right? So the ex exit button, I had mentioned in the previous, um, in the previous video that you'll want to have this, this code uh, kind of saved in a file somewhere, somewhere you can easily uh, get it in, in the instructions or in the sample library, you'll notice that there's just a simple line of code called this.close, which is, which is not wrong, but how many times have you clicked on the wrong button and um, all of your work is just gone. So for uh, one of the user experience uh, guidelines that, that you really should follow is making sure that you add that confirmation to the exit button. So let's go ahead and add that in here. So for this button, we're going to say ask user for confirmation to exit the application and if confirmed close the application all right so the code for this is dialog result we'll call it dialog equal message box we want, we want this to be a message box that we show to the user. Are you sure you want to exit? And we will name the box itself. Um, uh, if you want to a more in, a more uh, in-depth uh, reading as to what all of this means, I'd suggest taking a look at the previous video. I'm, I'm gonna try my best not to. Um, waste y'all's time with with repeating the same thing over and over again so the buttons that we want to give it is yes and no and we want the icon that it will display a message box icon warning okay and basically if if the dialogue Uh, equals the result of yes then we will close the application all right great so we've got that set we have our comment in here we should be good so now let's get into the meat of things so let's go and finally tackle this calculate button here uh, double click on the calculate button all right and the first thing that we're going to do is we well let's go ahead and uh, put a comment in here and says that this button retrieves the user inputted information and calculates the total of the order. 
All right, so let's think about this. So before we do any of the calculations, we have to think about what is it, what is the final result that we want from this? We want that total cost, right? So what are the pieces of information that we had discussed earlier that we need? We need that number of scoops, we need the cost of those scoops, and we need that sales tax. So the user is already putting this information on the form, but we need to be able to set aside, we need to declare a variable that will hold this information. And a good way to look at this, these variables, is if you think about, let's say, uh, let's say boxes, let's say boxes. So your computer has, has some memory, but we want to, we want to put some information that it needs to remember into one of these boxes. These boxes are variables, and we're going to put this this box on the shelf. So the program is going to pull that box when it needs that particular piece of information. So we need to think about these these pieces of those pieces of information that that we need, namely in this case quantity, the the cost, and the sales tax. So let's create some of these variables. All right. So let's start out with uh, let's start out with the quantity here. All right. And the way that we are going to do that All right. The way that we're going to do that is if we All right, so the way that we're going to do that is we're going to first start out by creating these, these, these variables in memory. So what we first need to do is declare what type of information is this going to be. Think about all the different kinds of information that there is out there. We've got numbers, we've got text, we've got uh, references. There, there are so many other, there are so many types of data out there. So we first need to tell the computer what kind of data are are we trying to do, uh, to to make here? Um, are are we trying to set aside? We want a double. So a double is a number uh, first and foremost, and a double can have um, uh, a double can have decimals in it. And there is some slides in Professor Fowler's uh, slide decks, and there's also some information in your book that tells you all of, uh, a lot of the different types of um, data types there are and kind of the limitations on that. And I won't go into that, um, as that's not the purpose of this particular video. Um, but for if you think about if you think about the cost of it, it's not an integer. An integer doesn't have decimals, so it's not going to be just one or two or three or four or whatever. It's going to be something like 199 or 198 or 98 cents or if you're talking about something at, I don't know, a football game, for instance, you might be looking at 999, whatever. But point is, it's got decimals in it. So this will be a double, all right? So we want to first and foremost know the quantity. How many do we? Um, uh, how many uh, scoops are we are we purchasing here? So maybe I'll say quantity of scoops. Notice the camel casing here. All right, and in the example um, that is provided in the C sharp library, this is all bundled together. But I'm going to break this apart so you guys can understand um, what's going on here. So quantity of scoops, uh, actually, let me back up. The quantity is always going to be an integer, right? So instead, let's do price of scoops, all right? Because that's going to be the one that has the decimal in it. And for uh, right now, you could, you could set it to a default value, but as of right now, it's zero. It's nothing. Um, by default, if you don't have any of that in your, uh, if you don't have the equals 0, 0.0 or whatever the case might be, um, it's always going to default to zero. So once you declare it, the default value for a double, the default value for an integer is going to be zero. So uh, you could do equals zero, zero if you want or not. That's, that's totally up to you. For me, I'm just going to not do that. So put a semicolon, 
So think about the next thing that we need we need from the user. We need the number of ice cream scoops that they are actually going to purchase. So that is going to be the integer. They're not going to order one and a half. You're not going to sell them half an ice cream cone. I mean, I guess I guess you could if that's your business model, but not in this uh, simplistic example. So um, for integers, the keyword here is int, I-N-T. And we'll call this number of scoops. All right, and semicolon. That would default to a zero. So we've got the two pieces of user provided information, right? Now think about the other things that we need. If you think about a transaction, what is it made up of? It's made of your subtotal and your total. We don't have a bucket to place that information in once we figure it out. So let's go ahead and make that information, or let's go ahead and declare those buckets. Let's, let's set aside those boxes of, uh, for this information. So we'll say double total cost, and that's going to hold our, um, our final calculated value. And remember, that's a double because that could have uh, it could have decimals in it, all right. And then the other thing that we we'll want to know is we'll need to know our subtotal, basically our price before tax. All right, subtotal, got that. That will also equal zero by default. All right. And let's see here, what else do we need? Oh, we need the sales tax rate. Okay, so for the sales tax rate, if you think about it, the sales tax rate isn't going to change. It's always going to be the same. Um, and that's, that's important because if you think about all of the different things that could happen in your code, all of the different variables that you could inadvertently set or change, you don't want sales tax to change because then you're going to have a very mad Uncle Sam show up to your door uh, or send you a very nasty email uh, or not email, a piece of mail, and they're going to be upset that you are not collecting the right amount of tax. So um, what we want to do is we want to declare this variable, uh, the tax rate, which in this example is 5.5%, but we absolutely do not want that to change throughout the course of our um, program running. So to do that, to kind of solidify, to cement this, this, this is going to be a box that's holding this information of tax rate, but we don't want this to change. We're going to use something called a constant, and that's C-O-N-S-T. That const right there means that this this particular bucket will not change. This is this will always be this, all right. And it's going to be a double. And in, we're going to call it tax rate. And we're going to go ahead and set the value of this tax rate right now. So it's five and a half percent. So if you think about it in the, the uh, form of a um, of a number, it is going to be zero point zero five five. That is five percent. All right. And just because I want to make sure that's extra clear, let me add a comment in here. Um, sales tax rate of five and a half percent. Okay. And it looks like we've got all of our different variables uh, declared here. So our variables, our buckets for information, those are now defined in our pro in our application. So when we need to call, retrieve, set those are the names that we're going to be using there. Okay, the next new concept that um, that was introduced to you is try catch. So try catch is kind of a uh, it might be a little difficult to grasp off off the top, but let me um, let me translate this into simple English. So try catch is a way to catch error messages before they bring down your program in a blaze of glory, right? You don't want, when something goes wrong on the back end, you don't want your computer to just, you don't want your application to just crash. Think about it this way. You're doing something in Word, right? You're writing this really long uh, paper about some crazy topic that your professor has told you to write 10 pages about. 
And if you're like me, you constantly forget to hit that save button. Well, let's say that you wanted to bold a, um, you wanted to bold something, but instead of selecting a word that you wanted to bold, you instead select a graph and you click bold. Your computer doesn't know what to do with that, more than likely. So instead of what you want it to do is you just, you don't want it to try to do it. And if it does try to do it, you don't want it to crash Word. Because if your if Word crashes, there goes all of your work. And nothing would be more infuriating than losing all of that, that work. I'm, I know you guys are familiar with it. It certainly happened to me a number of times. So we want to catch this error before it causes a catastrophic problem with your application. And the way to do that is through a try-catch. So what you're saying to the computer is, well, let me type it in here. So try, and this code, uh, I, so if you guys haven't noticed, I'm using an add-on called ReSharper, which is free to students, by the way. Um, it kind of adds a, so a couple of shortcuts in there for me, and I think this might be one of them. If not, never mind. But um, basically what we're saying here is we're saying, I want you to try, and let me add a, let me add comments in here to make this a little bit more clear. I want you to try this block of code, okay? And if there is a problem, I want you to catch the error or the exception. Uh, let me do this. And do this instead. All right, this right here is just extraneous, which we don't want to do, so I'll delete that for now. All right, so again, I want you to try this block of code right here between these braces here, and if there is a problem, if there is a catastrophic error, don't crash. Instead, I want you to catch that exception, and I want you to do this instead. All right, so it's a good practice to have this um, to have this around calculations because you know it is especially if you do a lot of math, uh, work in mathematics you know that there's so many different things that can happen you got your non-real numbers and a bunch of I'm not a math major so I'm not even going to attempt to go into that but um, but basically there's all kinds of different problems that can hap happen in a um, uh, in a mathematical computation so um, so it's a good practice to put this block of code, this try-catch, um, around, um, around uh, different calculations. So anyway, let's go in and let's, um, let's start coding some stuff. So what's the first thing that we need to do um, as, as the application after we've declared all of these buckets of, or boxes of information? What do we need to do? We need to retrieve this information from the application itself from that form we see all of that um, we see all of that information on that form think about it if you're processing paperwork you know by hand you're taking someone's handwritten form and you're looking at that information the first thing you need to do is get that information off of the page all right and the two pieces of information that we need is quantity and price so and this is going to bring us into another new concept called triparse so Basically, if you think back, think about if you're somebody who just wants to see, just watch the world burn, right? And you see this application. We'll go here to the designer form. It says number of scoops. So if you're a particularly malicious individual and you want to try to make this application crash, you might put something like cat in there. Cat is not a number. You know, what, what are you going to do with that? You, you want to be able to to get that you want to be able to get good information that can you that you can use to actually calculate um, and what that what if somebody added three and then a space the space isn't a number so what are you going to do with that well C sharp has this really nice built-in functionality called try parse and what that's going to do is it's going to try to parse the numbers out of what you give. In the case of cat, it's not a number. It's, 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 it's nothing. It's going to give you a zero 
if it if you add a three space, it's going to parse that um, by taking that 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 space off and giving you a three back. All right, so let's start out with the quantity. So it's going to be the way that you do this uh, try parse is you do int dot try parse, all right? And in these parentheses, what is the text that you're trying to parse? Well, we are trying to get the quantity. So quantity text box. When we're not trying to get the text box itself, we're trying to get the text out of the text box. Very important distinction there. We want the text. All right. So once we have that information, what are we going to do with it? What is this? Um, where are we going to put this this information? Well, we're going to output this information into the number of scoops. There we go. Number of scoops. All right. Add your um, in parenthesis if it isn't there already, and your semicolon. So again, in plain English. We're going to be parsing an integer. So take your integer. I want you to try to parse the text in quantity text box, the text here in quantity text box, and I want you to output your result to the variable called number of scoops. Okay? Let's do the same thing with, with the uh, cost. So let's do double, remember, because this can have a decimal in it. This can have. Um, a non-integer value, a 0.99 or whatever. All right, same thing. Double dot try parse. All right, and what is the information that we're trying to parse? We're trying to parse the information in the price uh, text box, but not the price text box itself, but the text in price text box. All right, and what are we going to do with that information? I want you to output that information to a um, uh, uh, to a variable called price of scoops. Okay. Add your semicolon, and there you go. So those two lines of code that is a huge um, lifesaver because if someone types in cat or a three space, your application isn't going to blow up. It's the, it's not going it it's 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 just going to elegantly handle that. So in, in cat, what's going to happen is if you provide cat, it's going to, uh, a cat in um, number of scoops, it's going to output a zero. If you provide um, three space in your price text box, it's going to output a three. All right. So that's what those two lines of code mean. All right. So let me go ahead and label this so it's a little bit easier to read. Grab the information from the form. All right. So the next block of code is we want to do the calculations. The calculations that are going to make up the total cost and the information that we're going to put on our receipt. We're going to do all of our calculations now. All right. So this next line of code here is going to calculate our subtotal. We're also going to calculate our uh, tax, and we are also going to calculate our um, our order total, our total cost in this case. And as I was checking my variables up there, something that I had noticed is a variable that I had left out. So we have something for subtotal, and we have something for total cost, but what about the the, the actual sales tax itself, the, the sales tax cost. So let's add that in here. And we'll just say sales tax. Okay. All right. Going back. Sorry for the jumping around. And I can't spell calculate. All right. So let's start out with our subtotal because that's the first piece of information that we need to know, right? Subtotal. All right. So our subtotal is equal to the quantity, or I'm sorry, the, the uh, number of scoops, right? Multiplied, and that is signified by the asterisk, right? Number of scoops 
and the price of scoops. Okay, subtotal is the number of scoops times the price of the scoops. Agreed? I'm going to assume you said yes. Okay. All right, so subtotal equals number of scoops times price of scoops. All right, the next thing that we need to know is we need to know the tax. What is the total of the sales tax? So let's type in sales tax here. And that is equal to the subtotal multiplied by the tax rate, which we had, which we had um, specified right here, which is, so it's essentially a subtotal times 0 0.055, all right? And this makes me think of, uh, makes me think of something that I, I wanted to bring up earlier is that when you're doing the, these uh, calculations, it's, in my opinion, better to actually use these variable names because even though tax rate is constant here, you're, you might be thinking to yourself, why not just put times 0 0.055 down here? And you could. Um, from a syntax um, perspective, there's nothing wrong with doing that. However, it's not going to help with your readability because let's say some, like you leave the company or you get promoted and you're no longer... Um, you're no longer dealing with this particular um, application anymore. Someone has to come in after you and figure out what's going on. It's a lot easier to understand that you are trying to do subtotal times the tax rate than it is to figure out, well, what on earth is 0 0.055? You know, of course, you can document it if you'd like to, but in my opinion, it's better to do these, app, uh, these, these um, uh, calculations as kind of like a formula as perhaps a math teacher would, would present it to you um, and not as something that's kind of halfway built, halfway not, because that doesn't really aid with readability. Anyway, so we've got our subtotal and we've got our sales tax. And by the way, sales tax is that subtotal times the tax rate. And I'm hoping we're all on the same page on that one. So now we finally need to figure out what is the total. So the total cost of this transaction is going to be equal to our subtotal amount added to sales tax. Okay, Subtotal plus sales tax is going to give us our total cost. All right, We should be good there. We're all in agreement there. All right, so from the perspective of this application, we've got our subtotal, we've got our sales tax, and we've got our total cost. The application knows this. Fantastic. Well, what about the user? The user doesn't know this yet. We have to provide this information to the user. So in order to do that, we're going to need to output this information to the form so that the user can actually see the result. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to output the total cost in our total cost label right here and we're also going to display the total of of this transaction in this list box right here all right so let's go back to our code here and let's say that this next block of code is going to display the output to the user all right so the first thing that we need to do the first thing is to um, display the total cost in that total cost label all right so the way that we're going to do that is we're going to put in the, um, the total label here. Make sure that you have total label selected, not total cost. Total label. All right, and we're going to set that label's text, the dot text. We want to set that equal to our. Uh, we're going to set that equal to our total cost that we had just calculated in that line above. All right, so there is a problem here, and it's not obvious because this is one of those quirks that you have to get used to as you, um, uh, one of these quirks that you have to get used to as you start to code. Total cost is a number. It is a double. The total label dot text is a string. String is a, um, a set of characters. Now, believe it or not, it might, it's not as intuitive to the PC to say, oh, you're trying to 
um, output this to a string, so we'll just do it. Some languages are, in this particular case, it is not, not in C sharp. So um, what we need to do here is we need to tell the computer before it tries to set the text um, to total cost that we need to convert total cost into a human readable string. All right? And the way that we do that is really easy. So you do the variable name dot to string. Easy to remember, right? And that's really all there is that you need to do. But what we want to do is that, let's say that the total cost comes up to be 295, right? We want it to look nice for our users. We always want things to look nice. It makes us look good, right? So what we'll do is we want to add a dollar sign to it and the decibel points, and we want it to make it look like, uh, a, a, like currency, the way that we intend it to look like. And the way that we do this is by using this formatting string that is going to be between these two quotes in, enclosed inside this parenthesis. Now, again, refer back to your slides that, that Professor Fowler has, uh, has provided as well as the book. It'll give you some of these different formatting um, techniques or uh, codes, rather. But the code that we're going to use is C2. And what that stands for is currency with two decimal places. Um, this is going to turn a 2.99 uh, into $2.99. Okay? So let's just say without, I cannot type today, I apologize. Without C2, you're going to see something like this, right? And with C2, you're going to see something like that. And here's another kicker. If, you've, if you think about it, sales tax, there could be fractions of pennies. So what if you were to see, what if you were to turn this particular uh, total cost into, into a string, and it's actually something like, like this? The users don't need to see that. We, our, our currency doesn't, for, for, for the most part, doesn't work like that. So we don't want to see 2.9904 We don't want to see that. We want to see just 299 as it is rounded off. And again, that's what that C2 is going to do for you. Um, it's going to give you, it's going to round it. It's going to put that dollar sign in front. It's going to format it as a currency with two decimal places. All right, that is a really long way to describe that, but I hope that helps with clarity if you were unclear about that. Okay, so the next thing that we want to do is we want to take a look at the, um, um, we want to take a look at the list box. So actually, before we go any further, let's, let's see if this runs. Let's see if this runs as we intend it to. Okay. All right. So the number of scoops, we'll say that there's one, and the unit price, let's say, is $1.50. So it should equal um, $150 plus some change for tax. So let's hit calculate here, $158, all right? Now, that sounds right, but I am not very good at calculations off the top of my head. So let's figure this out here. Let's, let's just double check this information. So 150 multiplied by 1.055. That's basically, uh, if, I'm sure you guys have done this calculation multiple times in stores, but you know we're, we're calculating it, by, or we're, we wanna get the total, so we want the $1.50 plus that five and a half percent. So equals 1.5825, and this actually brings us back to that formatting string there, because if we didn't include that C2, in that cost label, what we would have is 1.5825. But the user isn't going to pay 1.5825. They're going to pay $1.58. So that's what that that formatting uh, thing could, uh, formatting string can do for you. And this is good. This is great. We have done our job here. That's fantastic. Now, with the whole cat example, I calculate here. 
so it's going to turn that cat into a zero, just so you guys see what that try parse is like. All right, we'll hit exit. Yes, we want to exit. So we know that our calculations are good. Fantastic. One last thing that we need to do is let's add some information to that uh, to that totals list box that we have here. This receipt um, list box, as I've decided to call it here. All right. So as I had mentioned earlier, what you see in this list box is you see items. You don't see text. You see items of text. So what we're going to do here is let me show you this in action. We'll say um, we'll say receipt list box dot items. Okay. We want to add an item, and we want to call it subtotal. Subtotal, right? Add a colon after there. Let's just say a couple of spaces here, and then. We don't want to just display that on the same line. We want to add. So kind of like you would do with numbers, how you do 2 plus 2 is 4, you can do this with strings. But, you know, we obviously can't add, you know, two strings together. Instead, what this is doing is this is putting them together. It's gluing them together. All right. So we'll say subtotal. And we want the subtotal. Okay. Now, remember, when a computer sees this, it's going to freak out. Because we have subtotal, which is this string, because you'll notice that the, the quotes here, these, these quotes, this is a string, but subtotal is a number, it's a double, and it doesn't know how to add a number to a string. So what is it that we need to do? We need to add, we need to tell the computer to just convert subtotal to a string. So again, just like we did before, it's just subtotal dot to string. All right, and that formatting code C2 once again. That's what we like. And semicolon. All right, so what this does is we're going to say, okay, hey, receipts list box, uh, as for your items, I want to add an item and I want it to read this right here. And what that is is subtotal colon space space and the subtotal as a string that is formatted as currency with two decimal places. All right. Now let's do the same thing for the tax as well. All right. Sales tax. Let's, let's see if that will line up. Okay. And then we're going to add our um, our sales tax. And again. Just like before, to string C2 as our formatter, semicolon. All right. So we also want to add a break in this receipt. We don't want to squish everything together. We want to add a blank line. So the way to do that, really simple, is we're going to do, we're going to add something yet again. We're going to add another line. We're saying, hey, receipts list box. We're going to add an item, and we just want it to be this string right here, which is nothing. It's nothing. We've enclosed nothing in quotes here. And what that's going to do is that's going to add a blank line. Okay. And let's do this one more time for our, um, for our total cost. So we've got our receipts list box dot items dot add. And we want total cost. All right. And then we're going to add our total cost. Again, make it to a string, a currency with two decimals. Add your semicolon. All right. And I'm going to add some spaces here just so it all lines up and looks pretty for me. Okay. That looks good. Everything looks good there. Let's see what happens. Let's start. We're going to use that same example, one scoop, $1.50 a piece. Calculate that. And hey, look at there. We've got our receipt output. We've got our subtotal, which is $1.50. And um, we've got our sales tax, which is $0.08. Cents. Add those two together, and we've got our total cost of $1.58. 
Now, if the fact that these don't line up exactly is a little off to you, I know it is <laughs> to me, um, let's go ahead and fix that. So I'm going to close out of the application here, click yes. I'm going to go back into our designer here, into our re uh, making sure that we have our receipts list box selected. Let's change our font to something fixed width, like Courier New, for example. Courier New is fixed width. The I will take up the same amount of space as a G, right? And we'll click OK there. You'll notice that that, that um, name has also changed right there. And hit Start. Okay. How about we do two this time? at 299 all right and instead of pressing the calculate button i'm just going to hit enter or boom there you go that is all there is to it um we've got our our total right here showing up in cost label right down here as well as kind of our receipt view that we got here now notice this i'm going to hit calculate again i'll we'll change something just to keep things fresh notice that we've appended this information on the end here, this, this new transaction. But that's not really what we want to have from a user experience point of view. Yes, we can always have the clear button, and you notice how when I cleared everything, that cursor went right back up into the number of scoops. That's that dot focus in action there for you. It's cleared everything. We could hit that every time, but Again, we want to make our application as, as seamless as possible. So I'm going to add one more line of code. I'm going to exit out of this. Go back into our code here. And this is in our calculate button. So before you start to do anything, let's go ahead and if there is any other information in that list box, let's clear it out. Let's get rid of it. So clears information in the list box. And that's going to be the receipt list box. We want to call attention to the items. Clear it. So now if we start our application, and we say 2 at 4.96 a piece, calculate. And we do it again. This time I'm going to do um, Alt-C here. You'll notice that it didn't append to the bottom of this box. It cleared it. That way we're making sure that always the right information is shown on our application all the time. That's very important because we, the worst thing that we could possibly do, we'd rather crash and burn than have our application show incorrect data. At least in my opinion, you know, that might be different for anybody, for other people. But I'd rather have my application crash rather than to show incorrect data. All right. So uh, let's do Alt L for our clear function to make sure that works. That's good. Our, our shortcuts work. Um, let's say eight scoops at, well, let's say we are at a uh, football game, 12.99. Yeah, calculate. Boom. There's our, there's our information. It's working, uh, I believe, the, exactly the way that we want it to, to work. So that's pretty much it for the... Um, uh, for the ice cream sales application, I know that was a very long, deep dive into, into how to code this application, but I hope it was helpful to you. All right, so that concludes this video walkthrough through the ice cream sales app. Um, I hope you guys found this resource useful. Um, if you have any further questions, any concerns or comments, uh, either about the assignment itself or the video, uh, I welcome any feedback that you guys have. Uh, it's very helpful to me and will help me improve these videos in the future. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to me. Uh, my contact information is right there uh, on the screen. And for all of that, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope it's, uh, this has been a valuable resource to you guys. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you very much. Take care.